Hello and welcome to today's webinar on using maps in your family history research. My name is Ginevra Morse, the Director of Education and Online Programs at New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history. Today's webinar was made possible by our annual fund and we are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation is Alice Kane, Library Patron Services and Consultations Manager here at NEHGS. Alice supervises our team of library genealogists, manages our consultation service, and works with staff to plan and enhance our services to patrons. She joined the NEHGS library staff in 2012 after a 19-year tenure as a librarian at the Boston Public Library. Alice's genealogical specialties include Chinese American genealogy, Massachusetts and New England genealogy, cluster research, database searching, maps, and migration. So Alice will begin by briefly explaining cluster research and why this approach is really kind of central to our conversation today on using maps in family history. We'll then look at a number of different types of maps and how they can be useful, especially when used alongside land records. Uh, Alice will then point you toward a number of map repositories, both online and off, and we'll wrap up with a look at some map software, mapping software. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those after the presentation. There is no handout for uh, today's session, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow. You can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. So if you miss anything on uh, today's first listen, you can always go back and review the presentation. All right, so with that out of the way, I will turn things over to Alice. Thank you, Ginevra, and welcome to today's webinar on using maps in your family history uh, research. I hope that uh, what we cover today will be helpful and useful um, in your own project. So, as uh, many of you may have heard um, of cluster research or FAN research, uh, F-A-N, cluster research is a very thorough, low, sometimes uh, tedious method of studying all possible connected persons to answer a single question. Um, determining the father of a person is a typical question for which you'll need to um, be organized to identify one or more candidates to study in more detail. Uh, the initials F-A-N, uh, for me, stand for family, associates, and neighbors. Uh, some may say that the F stands for friends, but in working with many of our library visitors here uh, at NHGS, I find that um, other family members are often not studied uh, more extensively um, than they could be um, for additional clues about their target person. So, uh, as illustrated here, there are often circles of people associated with your target family member whose records might hold that next clue that will take you to the next generation back or uh, going forward to a new person. The study of your target person's fan club uh, can yield references to your subject of interest or uh, at least point you towards persons or records that you might not have considered yet. To facilitate uh, your cluster research, maps are a wonderful visual aid that coordinate your um, family puzzle pieces, uh, telling us more about the places our ancestors lived in and can lead us to potential resources. Information in uh, land records, city directories, and even newspapers can take on new meaning when they're coordinated on maps that show the areas that our family lived in. Uh, when pinpointing your ancestors' location, you will find family groupings, uh, jurisdictional boundaries, and migration pathways. In today's session, I'll be reviewing the types of maps available, um, as we had mentioned before, uh, where to find them, and we're going to have a case, quick case study uh, uh, to plan your research, and then finally, some mapping tools that you can use right now to start tracking those ancestors. So, let's get started. When thinking of maps, um, also think about the purpose for which they're created. Um, 
as you look at the maps and think about those purposes, uh, you might find some surprising details uh, uh, in the maps beyond the usual terrain and um, roads that you see on that map. Um, cadastral maps show boundaries and ownership of land parcels. Uh, this here is a 19th century view of the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts with details of the surrounding roads and their property owners. Um, this kind of map uh, is very useful to show uh, ground features and uh, distances between different things, uh, different um, locations as well. Um, in the United States, the Bureau of Land Management uh, Catastral Survey Division holds many records related to uh, public lands and have these types of maps uh, within their collections. In urban settings, Ward maps show jurisdictional divisions that help coordinate your research uh, into tax assessor records or even voting records. If you're able to find intact volumes, uh, city directories often feature ward maps uh, as part uh, of the book and they will fold out from either the back or the front uh, cover. Fire insurance maps are designed to display building compositions and list the current occupant or owner uh, of that building. And the fire insurance maps are the more famous of these types of maps. Uh, this is a sample showing nearby Clarendon Street uh, and the former location of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that was right here uh, in, the, uh, in the neighborhood of NHGS. And you can see that uh, the colorations are also an indication of different features. Uh, a good portion of the pink areas are, um, I believe, uh, a description of uh, brick construction. And then there are extensions in the back, little yellow bits, uh, that indicate uh, wooden construction. Um, as a analog to the fire insurance maps, uh, real estate maps, um, more famously um, done by the Bromley Company, are also well known for showing real estate um, assessed values in different neighborhoods as well as current owner and occupants. Um, both of these types of maps uh, began uh, coming into uh, creation in the 18. 80s and continued onward uh, to as recently as the 1960s. And the, um, for larger cities, you may find a series of these types of maps to cover various neighborhoods. Sometimes uh, a city such as Boston um, may be covered in portion before because of the uh, massive uh, changes and, and constructions um, going on in the city. The entire section is redone uh, over again within uh, a span of uh, 15 or 20 years. Next up are enumeration district maps, which exist for uh, most of the 20th century federal censuses. Um, these will give you the uh, boundary lines for the various enumeration districts. Um, many of them are, have been digitized and available uh, via the National Archives online catalog. So you can locate uh, quite a few of these maps for anywhere in the U.S. for 1900 to 1940, um, although some may not be online as yet. Um, an alternate source besides the National Archives uh, is the uh, Internet Archive. Um, they have uh, quite a few of the 1940 uh, and 1930 enumeration district maps available. Earlier than 1900, the Census Bureau uh, relied on local voting district descriptions and maps. So uh, one of the best places to get um, more ward maps from around the country, of course, would be the Library of Congress map collection. For traveling, road maps and atlases show the available roads and land features our ancestors had to contend with. Um, remember to always look uh, at waterways as well as a possible pathway um, for your ancestor. 
topographical maps are the most descriptive in showing you um, various land features of where our ancestors lived. And such maps do include uh, local landmarks, uh, some building locations, as well as um, lines to define um, elevations and other natural features in the landscape. So now that we've gone through very quickly the types of maps, um, there are a number of uh, websites out there that um, have a good selection um, of not only the types that I've mentioned, but also um, maps gathered on a theme. Sometimes we may be looking for something um, that is uh, um, <clears throat> from a particular time frame or um, around a particular demographic. So. Here is a statistical sampling of what the Library of Congress's map collection has to offer. Uh, some of these numbers uh, do repeat uh, across the categories, um, but as you look at the collection for maps describing um, war districts, topographical features, land ownership, and even there are military maps that can be helpful. Um, the, a quick note on the military maps, they can uh, be used, or that is they were used, uh, in uh, conflicts to locate and identify all the local homes and businesses and uh, they will also make note of their various affiliations whether they were for or against um, the current occupying force. Uh, for exploring Library of Congress's maps by themes, uh, they offer an online geography and map reading room page and the links on this uh, page are really an awesome collection of different themes, um, even uh, global areas uh, of interest uh, that can be helpful as part of your um, of your research. Uh, the Library of Congress is particularly uh, very well known for its railroad maps and, of course, its a very large Sanborn Fire Insurance collection. The Perry Castaneda Library at the University of Texas in Austin um, has one of the largest academic collections of maps to match the Library of Congress. Granted, as you can see from the list, they do have a very large number of historical maps for Texas um, in its collections, but you can see a glimmer of the different uh, themes that they can also cover in addition to uh, areas around the globe. The Atlas of the Historical Geography of the United States is hosted by the University of Richmond and their website is chock full of maps uh, based on historical themes. Uh, here you'll be able to find chronological series of maps um, that is helpful in determining um, settlements, settlement patterns, migration patterns. There are maps based on uh, political parties over uh, different uh, time frames. Uh, there are series uh, based on land acquisition, um, the expansion of churches uh, listing by denominations, uh, the expansion of uh, colleges and universities across the country or in specific states and areas. There are even um, uh, maps related to Native Americans and where they've uh, been moved around to uh, and settled. And then finally, they have a very nice collection of military history maps for uh, all uh, eras of the United States uh, history. The U.S. Geological Survey's National Map, map website uh, is your inroad to historical topographical maps. Uh, if you were to visit the USGS uh, main page, you would certainly be given access to a lot of the modern maps that are available today. Um, but for a look at their historical maps, uh, this page is the, the place to come to look for anything that um, predates the 1900s. Local to NEHGS in Boston is the Norman Leventhal Map Collection at the Boston Public Library, which regularly exhibits its collection on themes. Um, they have an actual gallery um, where they mount very, very large uh, exhibitions that span 
different historical and cultural topics. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I was quite impressed by an exhibition that they mounted on fictional maps from literature. Um, you can see a sampling of all of their past uh, exhibitions. Um, if you were to click on the exhibitions link, uh, on their main page and then select the past exhibitions tab to see a, a quick overview of what they've offered. Um, I do know that up and coming in 2019 they will be offering a new uh, exhibition on migration within the United States. Uh, focusing on historic county boundaries, which would be useful, which is useful to all of us in uh, in doing genealogical research, uh, do visit mapofus.org. Uh, this website offers uh, views of boundary changes by year. Um, they've gone specifically uh, to looking for contemporary maps to illustrate uh, all of the boundary changes, and there is uh, also a selection of um, historic map. Uh, uh, opportunities to see uh, using David Rumsey's website, of which um, we'll uh, describe a little bit more in a moment. Along the same line as mapofus.org is uh, Chicago's Newbury Library uh, website, uh, which hosts the Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. Now, for a good number of years, uh, they had taken the site down. Um, to revamp it, and what they've uh, reintroduced is truly an amazing collection of maps coupled with historical data. Um, you can choose uh, on the left-hand sidebar for the state of your interest any of the dates, and a, um, a box will pop up to give you information about when um, certain boundary changes were enacted, uh, descriptions of those boundary changes, and any significant um, pieces of information involved uh, with those changes or legislation. And um, you can certainly get uh, specific county information um, by uh, mousing over particular areas of any of the maps that are on display at this website. Um, I mentioned before David Rumsey map uh, collection. Uh, Mr. Rumsey is an entrepreneur who, um, when he uh, was uh, successful, uh, uh, um, successful in his business, uh, indulged in his passion for maps. Uh, I understand that his entire collection is now digitized and available online for free use uh, by people uh, to uh, to come and visit and see what they can um, uh, see from the collection and. Um, he has a a good collection of road as well as land ownership map. This is my uh, one of my favorite places to come to to find contemporary maps to see the terrain in which uh, I'm dealing with when doing research. I'd like to highlight for you um, a special feature uh, that Mr. Rumsey's uh, collection online is now uh, offering. Um, Georeferencing is a digital technique. Uh, to overlay a historic map on top of a modern one so that you can get a, a, a real-time sense, uh, as it were, of um, the historical locations um, on, on that modern map. So as a sample, this is uh, Thomas Jeffrey's 1776 map of the southern section of uh, the provinces of New England and New Hampshire, as, as this uh, map was labeled. And it is uh, the georeferencing tool that is on Mr. Rumsey's uh, site is used to match up the larger boundaries of the map of the, of the historical map onto a Google map of the same area, so that the georeferencing tool will work with any map that is on his website, um, and you can overlay um, anything uh, that that is within his collection online onto a modern map such as a Google map to get a general idea of how uh, of of the actual modern references to your historical locations. Um, it is possible to zoom in or out. Um, the one thing I'm not quite sure about is whether you maybe would be able to acquire a, a copy, a digital copy of the geo-referenced uh, map. So 
where else can you find maps in addition to the to these locations? Certainly check um, online catalogs for such terms as uh, maps, catastral, geospatial is an academic term um, which is used and applied to maps, uh, but local libraries, city and town clerks and assessor's office will have a very local uh, maps for the area, as well as national, state, and provincial libraries and archives will have uh, very nice collections across time frames um, so that you can get a, a very good chronology of different areas. Historical and genealogical societies will also have their share of local maps uh, in the areas that they focus on collecting. And of course, don't forget the academic and university collections. Um, uh, specific map and geospatial collections as well as in their general library collections. Um, atlases uh, figure very prominently in quite a few of these academic collections. So connected to uh, maps, of course, are uh, land records. And I'm just going to go over a very quick list of the different types of land records that you can look for um, when you're working with maps. Um, Land grants and patents overall are given to individuals or companies by different authorities, from kings to colonies uh, to governors and then to individuals. Uh, proprietorships are connected to the person or persons who are given ownership of a colony, and they would have uh, full authority to establish government um, in those locations and to also distribute the land. Uh, these ownership records are very often uh, recorded separately from land that is registered at the county or town level. So if you're looking for um, very, very early owner um, uh, colony level uh, uh, records of land, uh, you'd be looking for proprietorships. State land grants are land grants given to individuals by a colony or later by a state. Um, there is a similar term, which is land grant state, that is actually connected to 19th century national legislation that helped to create uh, agricultural colleges around the U.S. Um, there are uh, an, uh, an agricultural college or university in every state um, from this legislation. Public and federal uh, land grants are, of course, grant, grants of land given or sold to individuals by the federal government or their agent. And military bounty land grants are given to individuals uh, or their proven survivors in return for their military service. Uh, most of these records uh, can be found in a state or a federal archive, uh, but to be sure, um, the FamilySearch.org uh, website has research wikis which describe uh, lots of different topics and they do have, uh, as illustrated here, a land and property uh, research article on every state in the United States that will let you know um, not only where and what kind of land records you can find for that state, but it also uh, will discuss and introduce you to local issues to consider when you're researching records of these, these types. Um, the URL provided, you can substitute the name of any other state to uh, quickly get to the uh, article for that respective state. NEH, the NEHDS Library uh, has copies of these volumes and more um, to expand your understanding uh, about using land records in your research. Um, the locating your roots, uh, discovering your uh, ancestors volume is particularly readable um, and the land and property research in the United States offers a very detailed offers a very detailed discussion of the uh, state land grants and the federal lands um, that are involved uh, in the creation of, of each of those states. Static local data, such as county names, their establishment years, and, and their general boundaries, can be found in references like this. Um, many uh, Public libraries will have copies of the Red Book, which I'm sure uh, a number of you are familiar with, uh, that have uh, been doing re uh, genealogy for uh, a, a time. 
um, township atlases of the United States, they're no, while they're no longer producing new editions of this particular volume, um, the current volume that you can find in your local library is really um, very comprehensive and exhausted in describing and um, visualizing for you the various townships in each county jurisdiction in the United States. Now for a, a quick uh, study to illustrate using uh, maps to plan out um, some research tasks, I have um, the Burns family, a library visitor, uh, came and was looking for um, how to approach finding their ancestor, Daniel Burns, and his family. Uh, he and his uh, immediate family lived in Crawford County, Kansas uh, for most of their lives, and census information indicated that Daniel was born in 1881 in North Carolina. That was the most consistent um, detail. And from the age estimates, uh, it was about 1881. And her main objective uh, in coming to the library was to try and figure out uh, Daniel's parents and to find a birthplace in North Carolina itself. Um, more local, more local records in Kansas really couldn't tell her much more than that. So uh, just on the off chance, she stopped in at our library to see what we can uh, suggest. Now, when I'm not familiar with a uh, particular geographic area uh, and their resources, I often use and suggest uh, Family Searches Research Wikis, which uh, uh, is uh, illustrated here. They have wiki articles uh, with details description of every county in every state of the U.S. Um, as, as I understand it, they often invite uh, knowledgeable local uh, writers and researchers to help write them. And of course, uh, you'll find uh, for some uh, areas, uh, some of the uh, wikis might be in progress, but they're very comprehensive uh, in, in what they cover. They will uh, describe and list for you as many record sources that you're likely to want to know about in, uh, in that particular jurisdiction. So for many of these county wiki articles, um, they often do include either a basic uh, county or township map like this so that you can at least get a general lay of the land. Some of the map illustrations, they've changed a little bit and they've gotten a little bit more detailed and, and it's very refreshing to see those. Um, so when I showed the, uh, the visitor uh, this particular page just to give her a more general idea of what's going on in Crawford County, um, on seeing this map, she, was, um, she saw that it was near the Missouri border uh, and that uh, for the nearby areas, uh, a, another relative of hers had done some research in the Missouri area and had told her about um, a, a huge flock of other Burns families uh, in Barton County, which as you can see from the map, immediately next to Crawford County. Um, but the, uh, the other relative had not found any familiar names and nor had she when she reviewed the data. So. But in terms of the proximity, um, this is a very good point uh, to start looking at uh, earlier and later censuses on both sides of the state line to see if there will be any familiar given names uh, within the respective family. Um, the visitor did let me know that Daniel is a particular name that came down within the Burns family and uh, it was not um, very common but it wasn't immediately found by the other relative in Barton County. To check on boundary changes, uh, mapofus.org is very handy in showing you a broader view of the counties. For every year there is a uh, county boundary change. The creators of this website found contemporary maps to make uh, an outline drawing. And for each year, um, as you'll know across the bottom, the, each year that there is a county change, they've enumerated it and have a respective outline map so that you can see the additions um, and changes, and there are notes at the top of the list uh, for, for you to know specifically what the changes were. Um, do note the play, stop, and other buttons at the top of the, uh, uh, of the entry there. Um, 
this is called an interactive map, and so it is. Uh, you can play every one of these years uh, as a slide sequence, and you can watch uh, each of these uh, maps change from one to another and see the uh, original uh, territory, as it were, for, for Kansas, the original territory changed to a state as new uh, areas and counties are added. Um, for this case study, this particular view of Kansas is one year before the creation of Crawford County itself. So Daniel, um, uh, estimated born in 1881, was not alive at this time, but it's certainly possible that he or one, excuse me, that one of his ancestors uh, might have settled here first uh, and invited uh, his, his own family to come later. Um, Crawford County uh, comes from land that was contributed by Bourbon and Cherokee counties, which are lo located in the lower southeast corner of the state. In the following year, uh, you'll see that Crawford is now set off from Bourbon and Cherokee, and you'll also note that the rest of the state has also expanded to include potential new counties whenever they uh, shade in different areas. Uh, that means that this particular year may be um, a transitional year where things are laid out, but uh, uh, county lines are not actually uh, officially final. Um, and so uh, that's why this uh, particular area is grayed out. Uh, so each, each state in the U.S. will have a respective page with its own uh, groups of maps and sets of years uh, for the county uh, changes. And um, I should note that when you're loading this page in your browser, uh, this is how the page should look with uh, black letters indicating the years. Uh, sometimes in loading the interactive feature to play your slideshow, you, you may have some difficulties uh, in your browser in loading that part of it. And uh, if that happens and your years are loaded as blue, uh, then you will need to probably clear your cache and then reload the page um, um, fresh from um, from mapofus.org to, to get the interactive um, uh, links. So combined with this feature of different years for every boundary change, uh, you want to take your timeline of your ancestors' life dates and see what the jurisdictional lay of the land was in comparing the land, the, uh, the date change and your ancestors' date. If there was some sort of jurisdictional change around the time of, say, a person's birth, uh, there is that possibility that some of the uh, records may not have migrated properly from one jurisdiction to another, so that there might be uh, the past jurisdiction or maybe the next, uh, the the newer jurisdiction that you need to check for uh, that the that the records might have ended up in. Kansas is a uh, public land state, and it's laid out um, in a very geometric way, uh, all squares. Um, and besides the Bureau of Land Management website, which has a lot of uh, uh, catastral, uh, or that is land ownership maps, Historic MapWorks is another website that you can use uh, to locate land ownership maps after again, the Bureau of Land Management and Library of Congress. Uh, from this county map um, on the historic map works, we can click into the various uh, towns uh, to see uh, more minutely the uh, actual landowner uh, maps for the towns involved. Uh, the Burns family uh, comes from Walnut, which is located on the left, and we were able to run through and find the actual town map and identified a couple of uh, landowners of the same Burns surname um, to study. Uh, now, in the time frame of our library visitor's ancestor, um, the Burns family possibly could have traveled by, uh, by railroad. And uh, Daniel's town of residence, Walnut, is actually located uh, quite close to a railroad station, as it turned out. And uh, off we went to visit the Library of Congress's railroad maps collection. Uh, 
Um, this is the uh, initial page for the collection, and uh, you can filter the search by uh, the various uh, features here and by, of course, the location. We found a relevant map covering the possible east-west uh, travel of uh, the Daniel Burns family. And uh, this map shows major uh, railroad lines at about 1800. This map actually dates a little bit before. Um, we see Crawford uh, a little bit uh, on the left-hand side, almost to the edge. And the major line is course, a heavier line, and then the dotted lines show smaller railroad companies' uh, uh, lines uh, connecting up to uh, the main line. Um, we had a working theory when we looked at this that uh, potentially Daniel's mom could have been traveling while he, she was pregnant with him, so that with that kind of theory and using this map, every stopping point on that one railroad line, one segment of it, opens up quite a lot of uh, record location possibilities to check between uh, Kansas and North Carolina. Um, again, um, we would use uh, data and other information from other sources to hopefully narrow down, but again, this is cluster research, so there is that distinct possibility that uh, if uh, you don't have any um, fine-tuning type of information or data, then it may very well be that uh, it would be a methodical search uh, station by station to see if any of the local records mention um, your uh, family of interest. Now, while there is some lots and lots of possibilities in going backwards, uh, it would be really too many at this stage. Um, we did uh, locate in this particular collection another map of the railroad lines continuing right back into North Carolina, and that will help us uh, figure out specific cities and towns along the way in uh, the North Carolina area that should be on our radar as we're looking for additional record sources uh, and census information to see if any of that information uh, matches what we're looking for. Uh, as you discover more locations of interest from your map viewing, um, there might be mentions of your ancestor or someone of the same surname, for those with rather unique surnames, uh, in newspapers. Uh, there might be articles in the same areas uh, that appeared in the same areas that your ancestors lived. Um, in that case, uh, for locating newspapers, give the Library of Congress's Directory of U.S. Newspapers uh, a try. Uh, this is the search page that will lead you to um, all the U.S. newspapers and uh, their repositories uh, that hold copies. Um, uh, the background to this particular uh, database is that uh, from the 1980s, there was a uh, national newspaper inventorying project to identify um, all runs of newspapers from every state. So every state had its own project. And um, the other thing uh, was to uh, arrange for the preservation of those uh, runs of newspapers that were in the most need. So in addition to inventorying, preservation, and uh, more preservation microfilming, um, and in this case, it's a great way to figure out if something has been digitized. So this is a searchable database that is the culmination of, of this national um, inventorying project. Uh, the directory is searchable by state and county and town if, you, if you'd like. Um, but like in any uh, database search, you definitely want to keep your uh, database searches broad to state and county. Since news does travel, you might want to just um, use the broader uh, search areas of state and or county and see what trickles through to other areas of the state or even nearby states such as uh, Missouri in this uh, illustration. So. Um, at one point in our discussion, the, our library visitor here uh, mentioned that the Burns family was uh, connected with mining, and uh, it seemed to have been a occupation that, that kind of ran in the family. So using this database, uh, we were able to locate a few local town and county newspapers uh, that uh, she could check for news and information uh, about mining uh, and mines, uh, checking for 
uh, news of opportunities, strikes, disasters that have happened uh, that would have influenced um, the, the Burns family to move around uh, and or settle in um, Kansas or Missouri, if that is the case, uh, where they ended up. So, uh, so finally, in overviewing this project, uh, the library visitor was advised to find and study siblings and spousal families, um, in particular the, uh, the tantalizing um, group of Burnses that are located in Barton County, Missouri, uh, using familiar and or unique family names that tend to uh, appear and reappear uh, generations uh, over the generations. Um, and definitely check uh, jurisdictional formation and dates uh, against what you already know about your individual family members or, or their particular history. Are there any um, uh, dates that would send you to looking for additional locations for records? And in planning out your tasks, uh, also consider occupations and skills uh, in identifying your family member in city directories or to learn more about their particular industry or their uh, area of residence in the local newspapers. And of course, look out for uh, migration factors and possible routes, routes uh, that would have influenced where your family went or ended up. Uh, Definitely migration factors would uh, influence uh, people leaving or arriving at uh, different and new locations. Um, we're going to touch on mapping software and um, there are some sophisticated pieces out there to help you uh, map out uh, land records and other uh, and other uh, uh, areas, uh, other things using maps. Um, Deed Mapper 4.2 is the latest edition of a digital uh, mapping software that can uh, document meets and bounds descriptions in land records. Uh, meets and bounds are the corners and boundaries of a particular land parcel. Um, and uh, this software is capable of handling um, multiple boundaries we find the, besides the usual four corners of, uh, of um, land descriptions that you would find in a land record. Sometimes land um, descriptions in deeds can encompass uh, lots of very odd shapes and uh, boundary points such as trees or stones and this particular piece of software is uh, very capable of handling um, all the different types. Uh, the illustration shows you a, a uh, meets and bounds which is very oddly shaped and the software is capable of overlaying it on a modern Google map or whatever other map you choose to supply uh, to the software to bring the two uh, together, your outline as created by the, uh, by the software and then whatever modern map uh, you choose. Google Earth Pro is a free piece of software from Google and um, you actually have an option to use an online version which is not quite as good uh, but they do have the free uh, installable version of, of Pro. Um, one of the things that is particularly interesting about the Google Earth Pro is that in addition to the maps that Google Earth can supply, um, there are many many map uh, websites that are now offering um, maps that are now um, programmed to fit to run within Google Earth Pro so that you can do a lot of very interesting um, boundary or view manipulations. As an example, um, Newbury, the Newbury Library in Chicago that I mentioned before uh, has their Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. 
um, one of the features of this atlas is that they do offer downloadable information files in a file format uh, that is .kmz. Uh, these KMZ files can be imported into your Google Earth program and uh, can be used to uh, show you information, historical information um, about that uh, about that area. So KMZ stands for Keyhole Markup Language Zipped. Keyhole was one of the original founding companies uh, that created the viewing software that is now used by the Google Earth software uh, program. Um, sticking with Google, for those of you who uh, have a Google account, um, you actually can now use Google Maps to start tracking your own relatives. And this is a, a feature called Your Places. The Google Maps area uh, to choose, of course, is Maps from the main feature um, after you've logged yourself in. Uh, you would then choose, once you uh, have this next uh, screenshot, you would choose the little burger <laughs> Uh, icon at the top, uh, which will drop down a new menu for you. And among the options to choose it, down on the list is your places. Within Google Maps, this is where you can create your own maps. You can actually make lots of different pinpoint maps. Um, the there is, is no limit as to the number of maps that you can create and then lay over each other. When you've selected the uh, Your Places feature, you will be presented with um, uh, uh, different categories of maps that you might have worked on or saved already. Um, you want to choose the maps and you have the option of creating a new map with the link at the bottom or in this case um, I have a couple of samples uh, which we'll be looking at the first one. Um, uh, just as an idea, the Kane family homes um, for my husband's family, I have started creating a map pinpointing all of the address locations that I have found so far in census records. Um, so that uh, for any particular city, I can look at all of the residential locations and where they are uh, and see if there's a pattern or, or, or something in common um, in comparing two families. And, uh, and uh, that can give me uh, new ideas to, to use. Um, so the Brian and Joyce option uh, is something that I had created for a particular project um, some time ago. And when you click into it, uh, you can create as many pinpoints as you would like. You are able to uh, make uh, expanded notes. You can, again, uh, label them very simply, as you can see. Uh, I was using a city directory tracing to follow uh, a George and Thomas Joyce and a Michael Ryan. Um, they had married uh, uh, sisters, um, common to, to both of them, So, uh, and this was tracking down where they were, and the pinpoints show them uh, in very close proximity to each other, and um, at one point uh, I did have, find a marriage record uh, of a Reverend Matthew, I think it was Byron, and uh, he was, uh, I think, the common thing between all of them. Um, they all went to the same church. Um, the pinpoint in the center, which that's close to, I think, Brookline Village, is the one that was in common for the reverend, and that was where he was located, and everybody was located around him. So that was the commonality that brought the, uh, the family together. Um, another thing that you can find within the Google uh, within the Google Places here is that, uh, again, you are able to create uh, as many labels as possible and it is possible for you to move things around, change colors as you need to. And uh, the uh, descriptions can certainly be uh, as uh, as comprehensive as you like uh, or not. and. But the common, the nice feature is that you also get the actual latitude and longitude number 
for the exact location. So if you really need to uh, plot it on a Google map, for example, if you want to transfer some of this data to, data to Google Earth, there are options uh, within the upper bar to transfer that as well to a Google Earth program and to save it. And as you can see on the, uh, on the main uh, box for the this particular collection, um, you can add layers so that if you want to, you can do um, multiple maps and lay them one over the other so that you can keep uh, your separate pinpoint maps separate for each different family grouping that you're going to be doing um, and then um, bring them all together um, when you need to. And of course, they have the ever-present share button so that you can take a snap of your map uh, or share the entire thing with uh, family members as you choose. So I hope that uh, uh, many of you will try out the Google Map Maps feature, Your Places, uh, as part of your uh, genealogy research to uh, document where all of your people uh, have ended up in modern times. So quick review, uh, maps are definitely a component for cluster or fan research and uh, by looking at the geography they definitely can give you a lot of, uh, a lot of different ideas and uh, approaches to your research uh, when you think about uh, who created the map why, and uh, why. Uh, land records are definitely a major source resource to use with maps but not the only thing. Um, city directories uh, can be helpful as well. Newspapers are another. And then finally, uh, you can create your own map resource using the Google Maps uh, Your Places feature uh, or just create a geographic timeline using a spreadsheet to document all the places uh, that uh, your family member has been in um, uh, combined, uh, against uh, his own personal uh, timeline and see if that doesn't bring any, any new ideas. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Alice, for your great presentation. So let's pause here and see if you have any questions. Go ahead and type your question or query into the question panel, and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so Brenda asks, uh, can Google the Google Maps that you create can you print those? Yes, whatever you've created um, and is visible on the screen, you can certainly um, print using your browser. Um, the share feature will, I believe, will allow you to share a link to your particular map, um, but I believe it might also, I haven't experimented too much with the, the share uh, a file feature. I do know that it will share a link to your map, um, and your browser uh, print feature should be able to print what is viewable on your screen. Thank you. And I'm going to have to try that out because I can think of so many ways to use that um, for for genealogy, especially looking at clusters of people kind of by the year where they move to. So I'm really excited to, to test that out. Um, James asks, do you have any recommendations for map sources in Canada, uh, particularly Nova Scotia? Um, as I mentioned before, uh, national, state, or provincial archives, in this case for Canada, uh, are helpful repositories, and they're definitely uh, in the business of collecting everything related to the history of their particular place. So uh, the National Archive in Canada would be one location um, on the internet or in person if you happen to be there uh, to visit. Um, the Provincial Archives in uh, Nova Scotia would be another location um, to try out and see uh, uh, what their online catalog uh, has uh, for their particular holdings. And of course, if you're uh, interested in a particular location, definitely check out the local historical society or the public library. Sometimes um, public libraries have an amazing collection of local history and local atlases and maps. And we have a few questions about this. and. 
And I think you mentioned it throughout the presentation here and there, but generally speaking, the websites that we that you showed, um, you know, whether it was the Library of Congress or David um, Rumsey or some of the other sites, Map of US, are those free sites or is there some kind of fee or subscription um, that you have to that you have to uh, sign up for? Um, all of the websites but one, well, actually all of the websites really, that I have shown in illustration are free to use. Um, some of them do have the opportunity, if you wish, to purchase a print version of what you're seeing. Um, but in order to use the websites, there is uh, no fee involved, and many of them do not even require you to become a registered user. You just go to the site, do your searching, and you can um, look at whatever is on there. David Rumsey's uh, website, uh, his map collection is not just the United States, it's global. It's completely free and open to anyone who wants to use it. Uh, he, uh, the geo-referencing tool is uh, amazing to uh, uh, overlay historical maps onto modern maps to, to get a really good uh, modern take on you know where our people can, were at the time and and what it might have looked like and um, he does offer the opportunity that if you did want to print then you know you would pay whatever the going rate is but again all of the sites that I've illustrated are free uh, one or two of them like David Rumsey and the uh, the historic map works is another site it, it is uh, definitely in the business of providing you with a print map if you'd like um, but to you to uh, go in, search, see what they have, uh, zoom in to, to particular areas, uh, that is all free. Wonderful. <laughs> Great answer. Um, now, Greg asks, is there a repository of digital copies of military maps? Um, you know, particularly, I think he's interested in the American Revolution. Um, but especially maps that detail battles and kind of unit movements. Are you familiar with any uh, any online repositories for such maps? Definitely uh, on the local level, where, wherever you happen to be, uh, or the, excuse me, the state that you happen to be in um, of interest. Uh, the local state archives or state library is likely to have uh, a collection of maps across the entire history of that state. For military maps, especially um, uh, locations where there were major battles, definitely the state archives uh, and library are, are likely to have uh, some. Um, military specifically, the institution that pops into my head first is VMI, the Virginia Military Institute. Um, their curriculum is entirely uh, on the military, uh, all aspects of combat and, and, and such. Um, they will definitely, of course, have uh, courses on history of uh, military conflict uh, and such, so they will definitely have their own stock or at least access to maps. Uh, contacting their reference librarian for uh, additional uh, recommendations uh, other than uh, what they have online. I'm sure that they have quite a few links for you to, to choose from when you visit their, their online page. Um, uh, they definitely would be the, one of the experts for military maps, if that is your interest, uh, the Virginia Military Institute. Thank you. And uh, David asks, do you have any familiarity with the Family Atlas plugin? for Roots Magic. Is that, do you have any um, experience using that or any suggestions or perhaps, um, you know, if, if there are perhaps other plugins for, for other genealogical software programs that you're aware of? I am not familiar with that particular plugin and I have, beyond the Google Maps, your places feature, uh, I have not uh, experimented with any one software program, but I can see that um, just from the description, uh, the brief description and name, that the uh, Roots Magic plugin is probably um, 
proprietary to, to Roots Magic that will do the same thing that the Google Maps can do for just about anyone. Um, I think that the plugin will take the data that you have in your uh, personal Roots Magic program um, if you are in the habit of inputting longitude, latitude information for locations such as cemeteries or houses or, or what have you, um, that plugin will be able to take that data from whatever you've included uh, and then put it on a map. Um, that, that's what I think that plugin does. And, um, and, but it's the only one that I've, I, I know about um, that, uh, from this discussion um, that would do uh, that kind of plotting for you. There, the other uh, software uh, programs out there might have something similar, or they may be developing something like that. Um, uh, but uh, personally, I don't have any other uh, experience beyond uh, using the Google Maps Your Places feature. Um, but from the description, that sounds like uh, what that plugin can do for you uh, within Roots Magic. Just a few more questions here before we have to wrap up. Uh, Brian asks, can Deed Mapper, which was you know one of the mapping software programs that you showed us, uh, can that be used in the UK or is it specific to um, to the US? Uh, Deed Mapper is, is it's created in the US. But in terms of the information that you're inputting to create these um, uh, these land boundaries, um, it doesn't matter if it's UK or anywhere else in the world. Uh, the software is only concerned with the details that you're putting in. So if you're putting in latitude, longitude details, that's fine. Uh, if you're putting in meets and bounds, uh, that is, um, uh, rocks and angles and distances, that's fine too. It doesn't matter where in the world this information comes to um, as long as uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the various measurements that is uh, known to the program. So the measurements would be, of course, uh, yards and feet, uh, rods, acres, so on. Um, all of the known um, distance measuring, um, measuring um, words uh, would be uh, covered by the uh, by that software so it really doesn't matter as long as you're able to supply the correct measurement uh, this piece of software should be able to plot any land outline for you based on um, what you put the, the information that you put into it it doesn't matter where and uh, finally, Richard asks, what is the most comprehensive online source for Sanborn maps? And if you can maybe remind people what the Sanborn maps are and where, um, in your estimation, what is the most comprehensive online source uh, for those records or maps? The Sanborn, uh, Sanborn fire insurance maps were created to uh, document building composition. They were used by insurance companies to uh, get a take on whether they, they would insure certain pieces of property. Uh, this, the Sanborn company would send out people to you know, survey the different buildings and then create the maps and would list either the owner or principal occupants of those buildings. Um, they're very, very useful as a snapshot uh, of the area that you might be interested in. Um, for large urban areas, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Sanborn maps were done in, in mostly cities uh, across, the, uh, across the U.S. Many US, major U.S. cities will have a series of Sanborn maps. Sometimes the series uh, may repeat for a certain area uh, because of the, uh, the developmental changes that are happening. Um, but all in all, the largest collection that I'm aware of is uh, at the Library of Congress. Um, they are definitely digitizing as fast as they can go. And as far as I'm aware of, they have the largest digital collection um, available at this time. 
Well, thank you again, Alice, for answering everyone's question and for your great presentation. Um, a number of people have asked if we can provide a list of the websites and um, the links that you referenced throughout the presentation. We can certainly do that. It's the end of the year. It's holiday time. This is our present to you. <laughs> so what I'll do is I will include that list in my follow-up email. Um, so you'll get a an email from me once the recording is available on our website. And I'll I'll, in that email, I will also include um, the list of the various websites that we've referenced throughout the presentation. If you've hit a brick wall, you'd like more hands-on help with your family history project, or have more detailed questions about the specifics of your research, you may consider scheduling a consultation or hiring our research services team. If you're interested in learning more about those services, you can write to the email addresses on the current slide or visit uh, AmericanAncestors.org slash services, and I will also include uh, this contact information in my follow-up email. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.